Many slaves didn't passively accept the horrors of the slave trade. Um, they rebelled and resisted in a, in a whole uh, variety of ways. Now, there were, um, of course, violent uprisings which caught the headlines, which um, I'll tell you about a few in a minute. But before, before that, I'd like to just consider some of the less visible ways that slave slaves resisted um, the, the horrors of the slave trade. Now, one of the key things that was, uh, was a widespread form of resistance was to, for slaves to uh, simply not work very hard and do work of very poor quality. Um, you know, the more they worked, the better quality their, of, of work they produced, the more money they would make for, for, their, for their owners. And so many slaves would work incredibly slowly, would um, deliberately uh, produce uh, produce work which is, was of a low quality. They would you know drop uh, crops. They would uh, ensure that, that the mill didn't work properly. Um, and and these slow daily acts of resistance that they could do to um, to stand up for themselves in face of the the, the horrors of their life. Um, they often uh, broke tools as well, quite deliberately. So, um, if they had if they had a scythe to 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 cut down crops, for example, they would they would ensure that it broke quite easily. Um, and they do everything they could to um, avoid uh, contributing to their own as well. Another uh, form of resistance was was to run away, was to was to um, flee from the plantation where you were working. And of course, because plantation owners quite often paid uh, quite substantial sums of money for, for healthy slaves, that actually this would hurt the slave owner um, financially, uh, as well as through the, the, the loss of labor. Um, and of course, this was a huge risk for slaves because the punishment for runaway slaves was incredibly harsh. Uh, many slaves who had managed to, to escape the horrors of slavery set up um, an organisation called the Underground Railroad. So this was a, a group of um, secret uh, contacts which slaves had with each other where they would help runaway slaves uh, move secretly from place to place, uh, avoiding detection of the authorities. And, and the aim was to ultimately uh, try and spirit the, the runaway slaves up to safe havens like Canada, where the um, laws about the enforcement of slavery was were more relaxed. But um, as I mentioned before, there were also full scale uh, slave rebellions. One of the uh, most famous uh, and most enduring of these was led by this chap called Toisson Louverture. And he was a slave on the uh, French colony of Saint-Domingue in the Caribbean. And um, it was a, an island full of, of um, plantations, and he led a, a massive armed insurrection of slaves that successfully uh, fought against uh, French military that were sent to, to quash the rebellion, and it managed to set up a, a free state for slaves, uh, which he called Haiti. In British colonies as well, there were uh, violent acts of, um, of rebellion by slaves. Um, in Jamaica, uh, many runaway slaves would um, form uh, their own little communities, which were called maroon communities. And these maroon communi communities would arm themselves um, and they would help other slaves to escape. They would um, also uh, harass um, uh, the slave traders, uh, you know, launch attacks from the woods, uh, as is shown in this scene, uh, and, and generally make life for the white plantation owners very, very difficult. And these uh, these maroon communities uh, in Jordan, and they're still the, the foundations of several communities in Jamaica today. There are also uh, countless examples of um, slaves rebelling whilst on the Middle Passage as well. Um, slaves would um, would rise up, attack the, the sailors and the captains, and seize control of the ships themselves, and on a few occasions managed, managed to, to sail them to a safe port uh, and gain their freedom. Um, there have been some estimates by, by historians that, that anywhere between 5 and 10% of journeys on the Middle 
passage actually face some um, some degree of uh, of insurrection um, on the on the journey. And there was a very famous uh, case of a slave rebellion on a ship called the Amistad, um, where the where the slaves were were, were ultimately um, caught, uh, tried, and punished. Um, there were there were also revolts throughout the the mainland of um, of America by slaves. Um, this illustration shows a a, a, a slave rebellion um, in New York City um, at the start of the 18th century, where where probably not as many houses as this were burnt down. Um, but it just an illustration of how the the slaves consistently um, and persistently rebelled uh, against their condition. Now these rebellions were were quite often uh, reported on, uh, not only in the Americas but also uh, back in Britain, and uh, this made people increasingly aware of the the horrific conditions that slaves were being kept in. The, these stories of rebellions also combined with several um, scandalous stories which uh, which hit the British papers. Um, and one of these, one of the most famous of these, is is a, a case about a slave ship called the Zong. And the Zong was a was a slaver on the Middle Passage. And the captain and crew feared that they didn't have enough drinking water for all of uh, for all of the slaves on board. And so, in order to um, get more money from their from their insurance policy. They decided that they would throw some of the slaves overboard, uh, drowning them, um, in order to to get more compensation from their insurers, because they'd get more money um, if the if the slaves died at sea than they would if they if they um, died from dehydration. And when people heard about uh, over a hundred women and children being thrown overboard and drowning to death, this led to um, to a huge upcry. Uh, particularly in Britain, and more and more people began to call for the abolition of the slave trade. And this this uh, this increased um, concern about about the horrors of the slave trade and calls for it to end was um, spearheaded by uh, a group that was established um, at the end of the 1700s, um, and led by this chap called William Wilberforce. Now, uh, William Wilberforce was a member of Parliament. He represented Hull, um, and he he was a key member in a group that was set up called the Committee for the Abolition of Slavery. And this Committee for the Abolition of Slavery uh, campaigned tirelessly um, to to get rid of slavery. They um, William Wilberforce gave many speeches in the House of Commons. Um, Explain to other MPs the the daily horrors that that, uh, that happens during the slave trade, but also the Committee of the Abolition of Slavery um, used all sorts of other um, tactics to get the British people behind them to try and to try and persuade the British government to end the slave trade. Um, one of the, the the key people in this group was um, Alauda Equiano, who famously uh, wrote an account of his life as a slave, um, and particularly on the Middle Passage. And Alauda Equiano's book um, about his life as a slave became a bestseller across Britain. And he, along with other campaigners, would go on tours uh, around Britain. So they would go to um, village halls. Um, where the the local community would come and listen to to their tales and to stories about the the horrors of the slave trade. Quite often, they take props with them, so examples of the of the iron manacles and some of the the punishment devices that were used um, on slaves. And, and these talking tours had great effect. They, they they really shocked people when they heard about it, which which led many uh, many British people to support. The, uh, to have the abolitionists to get rid of slavery. Um, there were also uh, a, a publicity campaign was launched as well. So uh, Josiah Wedgwood, who um, was a very famous potter, um, Wedgwood's um, crockery sets, so plates and uh, cups and saucers, are very highly prized 
items today. So if you're an antique shop, you see a, a Wedgwood piece of crockery, a uh, good price, make sure you buy it. But Josiah Wedgwood, he uh, produced this uh, medallion, which depicted a slave saying, am I not a man and a brother? And this became the the, the logo, effectively, of the abolitionist, uh, abolitionist movement. And this was replicated not only uh, in pottery, but also as brooches, as necklaces, as um, a logo in print uh, for the many pamphlets that the abolitionist movements used. Um, and so this this was used as a as a effective as an advertising campaign to try and spread the word about the horrors of the slave trade and, and how the slaves um, should be freed. But it wasn't just the acts of the abolitionists which began to make members of parliament think that the slave trade should be abolished. Um, Adam Smith was a, a Scottish economist, so that meant that he, he wrote books about um, how countries and companies make money through trade, um, uh, how banks operate and how money circulates around the system. And he published a very famous book at the end of the 18th century called The Wealth of Nations. Um, and in this book, he, expl he one of the arguments he makes is that actually slavery isn't profitable for the slave owners. He argues that uh, slave owners on plantations would make more money if they paid people to do the work and paid them money with incentives to work harder um, because they'd do more work, they'd do better quality work and therefore the, um, the plantation owner would be able to sell goods for more profit and make more money. Um, whereas if you use slaves and they don't work very hard, they don't produce very good quality uh, work because they are resisting, um, then actually this, the plantation owner can't make as much money. So, so it became the key economic argument that actually using slaves to do your labour for you doesn't increase your profit at all. You make more profit by paying people to do uh, a good job. So all of these the, these pressures, the, the stories of the rebellions, the um, the stories of, of the horrors of the slave tra trade and, 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 and headline grabbing stories like the slave ship, slip, slave ship Zong, um, the abolitionist movement, the, the um, plaques produced by Josiah Wedwood and um, Adam Smith, given the economic argument that slavery wasn't profitable, all came together to um, to persuade members of parliament that actually the slave trade should come to the end. So in 1807, the Slave Trade Act was passed by Parliament and this law ended the slave trade in the British Empire. Um, well, almost all the British Empire. This didn't apply to India. Um, that would have to wait uh, a, a few decades before, before it was enacted there. Um, but it was just the trade of slaves that was banned. It was still legal to own a slave. You just couldn't buy and sell one. Um, so that uh, act was passed in 1807. And, and this was quite um, actively enforced by the British government at the time. The British Navy would uh, would send their ships out to try and intercept any um, any slave traders that were that were sailing a British flag. And then uh, this was followed by the um, Abolition Act in uh, 1833, um, which finally abolishes all slave ownership in the British Empire. Um, and the British government um, actually said to the slave owners that they would compensate them for their loss of property now the slaves were freed. Um, and to do this, they had to borrow quite a massive sum of money from uh, from the banks at the time. They had to take out a huge loan in order to pay off uh, all of these slave owners. And this debt that the British government took out was only paid off uh, in 2015. So only five years ago, gives you some idea of how much money the British government had to pay to ensure that the slaves could be freed. But many, uh, many slaves uh, were, st were, were, were living and working um, in the United States of America. And the United States of America was no longer part of the British Empire. 
um, after they uh, claim their independence back in the 1770s. So uh, slaves, uh, slavery still existed in the United States of America, and it would take uh, a civil war um, in the early 1860s between um, the northern states of the United States of America, who who thought slavery should be abolished, and the southern states in America, who think that slavery shouldn't be abolished, uh, to to go to, to go to war, and eventually the um, the forces of the North, the Unionist forces, defeated the Confederates in the South, and effectively got their way, and uh, slavery was abolished throughout the United States of America. However, many of the slaves that were now free, their lives didn't improve. Um, what many of the plantation owners said is they said to the slaves, well, OK, you are free. You can go and try and work somewhere else, but you might not get any work and you might you and your family might starve to death. Um, what I can let you do is I can let, let you continue working on my, my plantation. Uh, but that, that house you're staying in, uh, you're, you're going to have to pay me for that. And those tools that you're going to use to work on my plantation, uh, I'm going to charge you for that. And the clothes you're wearing, I'm going to charge you for that. So how about you work for the next 25 years for me? Um, I won't pay you, but after 25 years, you can have the house and you can have the tools and you can have those clothes. And this system was known as sharecropping. So they're they're, they're, they're working on the, the land, they're cropping to get a share of the plantation owner's um, belongings. And so, in, in effect, um, they were now free legally, but their lives effectively didn't change. They were working on the same fields for the same plantation owner, living in the same house, wearing the same clothes, using the same tools and not being paid any money. And also, um, uh, the the uh, the slaves continue to face persecution, harassment from the from the white slave owning population, um, and there was segregation uh, enforced in the southern states of America, where um, there were increasingly black only cinemas, black only toilets, um, black only water fountains, and um, you know, it, it wasn't until the campaigns of Martin Luther King and the other civil rights campaigners that actually there was a, a legal equality between blacks and whites in America. But um, there's still uh, widespread uh, inequalities between uh, blacks and whites uh, in America today, which is one of the things fueling the uh, Black Lives Matter campaigns.